Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. From the perspective of Judaism and also from the New Covenant, we learn something. Paul, for example, in the book of Romans in chapter 9, is speaking about many important things. For example, the covenants that God made with Israel, the promises that are contained within them, the patriarchs, their faith, and we see the giving of the law. All of these things were important, but Paul says, above all is Messiah. And we must affirm that Messiah is more important than anything. Why is that? Because he is God among us. The only way to have a relationship, a, a connection to the living God is through the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua. And that's why the passages in the Scripture that speak about Messiah are so vital for us to understand. Now, we know that there is prophecy, and some prophecy is messianic, meaning it speaks clearly concerning the Messiah. It gives us revelation, insight, understanding truth concerning his identity and his work. We also know that there are Messianic passages elsewhere in the Scripture. And now when I say Scripture, I'm speaking not about New Covenant Scripture, what many call the New Testament. Obviously, this is the Word of God, but also the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And in many places in the Hebrew Bible, not just prophetically in the writings of those prophets, but also... Books such as Psalms, there are Messianic passages, passages that speak to Messiah. And in the Psalm that we're going to study now, there are a few Messianic passages. Now, this may not mean that the entire Psalm is all about Messiah. There may be a different primary person, that the psalm speaks to or a situation other than something that related to Messiah. But there are verses that speak equally and perhaps primarily to him or about him. And as I said, in the psalm we're going to study now, there are a few key and well-known messianic passages. So let's look at this psalm. And I'm speaking about Psalm 22. We're going to look at the first half of this 22nd psalm in this study. It begins with a very important inscription. We find once again that it's a psalm of David, but let's look. And again, it's the first verse in the Hebrew text. It says to the chief musician, or the choir leader, to the chief musician. And then we have a word that says upon or concerning. It's a word of relationship. And we have an expression. Now, the expression in Hebrew is ayelet hashachar. Literally, the word is related to a deer, but it's in the feminine. So a female deer. And the word shachar has to do with the early morning dawn. And we know that frequently one sees deer early, early in the morning. So it may not be speaking simply about a female deer in the morning, but the earliest part of the morning, right when the sun begins to, to rise and there's a change from darkness to light. 
And this time is special. It is emphasized. For example, we know that the primary prayer in Judaism, each service concerns this prayer. It's the foundation of it. It's called the Amidah or the Shmoni Esre. It's the standing prayer. And there is a tradition for those who are the most uh, uh, pious in Judaism, the strictest, the most meticulous in their observance. They like to pray this morning prayer and hit the Kedusha, the high point of the Amida, when the sun is rising at this time, a yelet hashachar. And this is known as nets as well, the early morning hour. So when we look at this inscription to help us understand the setting, the context, or some instruction concerning this psalm, we read, to the chief choir director upon or concerning Ayelet HaShachar, the deer of the morning or this earliest part of the morning, and then Ms. Morley David, a psalm of David. Now, we could understand this psalm simply applying to David, the difficulties, the hardships. We've seen already that he writes frequently about those who are in conflict with him and how David turns to God for help for deliverance, for victory, for overcoming the evil schemes of others. But this psalm is also uniquely related to Ben David, that is the son of David, which is an expression. We see it in the New Covenant, in the Gospels relating to Messiah. So let's begin. It'll be verse 1 in the English, but verse 2 in the Hebrew text. And we're all familiar of this verse, this sentence that Messiah cried out while he was on that, that tree, that cross, where he says, Eli, Eli, lama azvatani, my God, my God, why? Most English translations will say, why have you forsaken me? And it can accurately be translated in this way. It's a word of leaving. Why have you left me? And this speaks about a separation. Now, we know something theo theologically. We know it theologically because the New Covenant speaks of this, that the one who knew no sin, and we're speaking about Yeshua, Messiah, the one who did not know sin, meaning he never sinned, he became sin for us, and he took the punishment that should have been placed upon me and upon you. And at that moment when he became sin for us, there was that separation between God the Father and God the Son. And most understand that when he said this verse upon that tree, on that cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned, forsaken, left me, however you choose to translate this word, azvatani, it relates to this broken relationship because he became sin for us. He never sinned, but when our sins were placed upon him and he encountered the consequence of sin, this is when he said this phrase. Let's move on the second half of, of this verse. Rachok mishuati. Now, the word Yeshua, not Yeshua, that is the Hebrew way to say Jesus. But Yeshua, not Yeshua, but Yeshua speaks of salvation. But this is Yeshua T, meaning my salvation. And what it literally says here is far or distance from my salvation. And this certainly would be applicable because when we are in the midst of sin, we are indeed far away from salvation. Sin is the opposite of salvation. When we walk in sin, we're not manifesting salvation. Now, this passage of Scripture, it is not the second half of this verse was not applied to him, but 
It's certainly relevant. So this one, whether David is speaking this about his personal suffering and it has messianic implications, or whether much of these verses relate to Messiah and what he went through upon the cross, this is a matter of of great debate and speculation. And, And for the most part, when I share the word of God, I don't like to speculate. I don't believe that we should answer questions that, that do not have answers. I believe that is extremely dangerous and, and is spiritual malpractice. Only speak to what the scripture clearly speaks to. But it says here, far or distance from my salvation. And then we have the word divre shagati. Now, we'll see later on when we get down to verse 14 in Hebrew, 13 in English, we're going to see the word for roaring like a lion roars. This is the same word. Almost every English Bible translates differently, but what we have here is that that the author, the speaker here of this psalm, is saying that he feels far from his salvation. And the words of his his roarings, and it's a word of emphasis. I think many English Bibles will translate this groanings, and that's fine, but they're strong groanings. They sound like a lion's roar. So the intensity is being emphasized here. Let's move to the next verse. And here again, I'm not going to read all the Hebrew, but I want you to see that we're paying very close attention. I'm not using an interlinear, I'm not using some other translation, but simply looking at the text and wanting to render it without any type of theological bias what the words say. Verse verse 2 in English, 3 in Hebrew, my, my God, I call your mom. Your mom is daily. It speaks of perhaps yom yom, daily, or throughout the day. So, my God, I call daily or throughout the day, ve'lo ta'ne, but you do not answer. There's no response. And Lila, this is night, and here again, it's speaking about throughout the night, not just one moment in the night, but it goes beyond this. There is a a frequency, a consistency of crying out both day and night. We've already learned God is silent. There is no response, answer to this one in the day. And he says, Velo dimuya li. But not silent is to me, which is a way of saying, I'm not silent. At the night so this one is turning to God he is not silent there's a consistency of him and frequency of crying out and not being silent before God verse verse 4 in Hebrew 3 in English Veata and you Kadosh you are holy now we learn something In the previous verse, this one cries out to God, no response. And the next thing that this one says is, you are holy. See, God's holiness, God's perfection, everything about God that that causes us to understand the attributes of God, they are not dependent upon what he has to do. God is God regardless. His words declare, but his words do not achieve that for him. He defines it in his nature. So this is why it simply says, and you are holy. Yoshev. Yoshev sits or sitting. So God, he is holy. And the implication is you sit or you are sitting to Hilot Yisrael. This is the praises of Israel. Now, this also reveals to us 
us a spiritual principle. God is in the midst of the praise of his people. If you are in a difficult circumstance, hardship is is plaguing you, the wisest thing that you can do is begin to praise God. Why? Praising God brings God into your circumstances, your life, where you are. And that is the only thing that's going to bring a change. God's presence brings change. And we need to be the one that summons that. And we summon God's presence through praise, as it says. You dwell, you sit, you inhabit praises of Israel. Verse 5 in Hebrew, 4 in English. In you are fathers. And this is probably a more of a reference to the patriarchs, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. In you are fathers trusted. They trusted and they were delivered. Now, what it says here literally is you delivered them. And we see another principle. It is trust, reliance upon God, trusting him that brings about his deliverance into our life, into our circumstances. So the order is we have faith, we praise him, we trust that he will respond. Now, up until this time, this one who this psalm is speaking about, this one hasn't received any change in his circumstances. But he praises and he reminds himself and reminds you and me that the patriarchs, the fathers of Israel, the leadership, they trusted in God. They trusted and you delivered them. Verse 6. Unto you, Sa'aku. Now, Sa'aku is a word for, many might say cry, but it's a different word. It's a word for literally screaming or yelling. It's crying out in a loud voice with, with great emotion. It's oak is, is the verb to yell. And therefore, we read in this passage of Scripture, unto you they cried and they were delivered. In you they trusted and they were not ashamed. So he sees how God demonstrated his faithfulness in the previous generations. Among the patriarchs and perhaps Avotenu, our fathers go just beyond the the patriarchs in those generations. The generations of, of Moses, the generations of the judges, the generations of the prophets. So God has a history of proving to be dependable in in mediating to those who trust in him, mediating deliverance. But look now at this next verse, six in English, seven in Hebrew. Ve'anochi tolat, but I am a worm. Now, this word worm is a worm that produced the material that made scarlet. And some of the translators see this statement, I am a worm, speaking of him suffering, him being transformed while he was on that cross into sin. This abandonment, this loneliness, this helplessness that sin brings upon each person The only difference is, and I keep wanting to repeat this, and that's this. It wasn't his sin that he was suffering. He never sinned. He was totally, perfectly, absolutely righteous, pleasing to God, holy. But nevertheless, he, the Son of God, was suffering for your sin and my sin. So he says, Ve anochi tola'at. But I am a worm, 
Belo Ish and not a man. And then he speaks about how the shame or the disgrace of man, Cherpat Adam, the disgrace of man and the contempt of people. And the implication is this was placed upon him. He is suffering. Now, in one sense, this is great news. It's great news because he suffered, as I've said, this is the third, fourth time in our behalf so that we don't have to suffer. He's paid the price in our behalf so that we can avoid that judgment. He took it and he conquered death. He conquered the power of sin. His righteousness is greater than sin. God's grace, and there's a song that speaks about God's grace, greater than sin. This is what this is speaking to. Look now to verse verse 8 in the Hebrew, 7 in English. Ko ro'ai. All who see me, what do they do? They mock me. They, they open their mouth and they wag their head. Now, we know something. We, we know that, that this scripture about people wagging their head, mocking him, this was done in the gospel account. While he was on the cross, just the same way, if we look now to the next verse, in verse 9 in Hebrew, 8 in English, we have a quotation from Matthew 27 and verse 39, this section. Here it says, Gol et Hashem. Now, this expression, Gol et Hashem, is seen elsewhere in the Psalms. And the word goal here means to to move, to roll something. Usually something so heavy that you can't lift it, so you push it, you roll it along. And the scholars will teach us that this word has to do with commitment. So some will say, instead of roll, like roll your troubles upon him, cast your troubles upon him, it's an, an idiom for trusting relying, being committed to. And so we read, and this may be what others were saying in mocking and and wagging their heads. In the New Covenant, it reads, he trusted in the Lord. And it says, let him, meaning God, deliver him. But, But here it could simply mean He trusted in the Lord, and he delivered him. There's not that that optative in the, the Hebrew language like in other languages. He will save him, not let him save him in a doubt, but but he will save him in, in the original. He will save him because Chafat's bow. He delighted in him. And is this God the Father delighting in God the Son or God the Son delighting in the Father? Both, both are true. But what's so important is this. When we look at this in the original context, Psalm 22, then we see it being utilized in the New Covenant in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 27 when he was being mocked while he was being crucified. We see something. We see how the people didn't understand the fulfillment of these messianic passages. What God, through King David, was was teaching the people. Verse, Verse 10 in Hebrew, 9 in English. For you, this would mean God, burst me forth from the womb. Now, this is word, in a general sense, the stomach, beten in Hebrew, but it's oftentimes a synonym for womb. And it speaks about how at the right time, God the Father sent his son into this world to be born. And that's why it says, you, you, burst me forth. And the reason why I say burst 
is because this is the same word for a, a spring of water that rushes out of the ground and it becomes visible, noticeable. And here's something very important, useful. It has a purpose and that's why he was, was born into this world. It goes on and presumably the same subject you you caused me to trust while on my mother's breast so in this this young stage this one now whether this is messianic we can set it aside it may not be messianic but it speaks about how god works in the life of children how they can be taught biblical truth spiritual wisdom and principles and so this one and of course it's david saying that he learned god was ministering to him even as a young child verse 11 unto you i was cast forth from the womb this may speak of of being dedicated dedicated to the lord's purpose at an early age and from the betten, that is from the womb of my mother, he says, my God are you. Meaning that, that this one trusted in God from a very, very young age. Here again, some see so many of these prof uh, passages, verses as messianic. Some do not, only a few. You'll struggle, you'll pray, you'll study. And make your own decision but what i want to do is to share with you what the scripture is saying about how god can minister to young children verse 12 in hebrew 11 in english do not be far or distant from me for trouble is near and there is no one helping there is no helper so again this one who's speaking feels utterly abandoned alone no one that is assisting and helping and by the way we see that isaiah isaiah speaks about this same same message that messiah looked to see who was with him and no one was with him he was alone no one was concerned about the purposes of god so messiah himself alone carried them out that's why all praise and glory and honor belongs to him verse 13 12 in english many bulls this is the normal word for a bull many bulls surround me they have surrounded me and then we have a unique word Abire Bashan. Now, in the scripture, the term Bashan, this is a synonym for the Ramat HaGolan, the Golan Heights. And to this day, there's much cattle up there. And here we're speaking about a different word. One of the usages of this word is for a, a knight, a valiant one. But this is not talking about a human being, it's talking about a unique, the best type of cattle bulls and it says here we could translate it the the best of the bulls of bashan they they surround me now this is a synonym they encircle but it's interesting because this word is the same word that the term keter that is crown comes from what does a crown do a crown surrounds your head so even though even though this one is being surrounded by powerful animals we see something we see a reference to his kingship a suffering king in other words verse 14 13 in english but su elai pihem up unto me their tongues burst forth a lion and this is a lion that that tears meaning tear its prey and roars that same word 
and verse 14 of the Hebrew 13 in English is the same word that we see at the end of verse 2 in the Hebrew text verse 1 in the English so it speaks about and the word here is Arye Arye lion Arye Toref here this word Toref a, a tearing one that's so powerful that it can tear, tear its prey into pieces and it makes that sound that mighty sound of a roar because of that keep reading i was poured out like water and all my bones they were dislocated so even though and here again not saying all of this is messianic but in the same way that the scripture tells it that Messiah did not have a broken bone, the bones can be dislocated. And dislocating bones is extremely, extremely painful. So whether we see this as poetic language or literally, it speaks about suffering, intense suffering that this one is going through. Second part of verse 15 Haya libi ke donag. My heart was as wax. Now, some English, they put it in the present, but they ought not. There's a word, haya, it was. What was his heart? In this case, it says, my heart was as wax. Wax is easily melted. And then it says, melted in the midst of May I, this is the word for intestines, literally, but it's used oftentimes poetically, speaking about the very essence, the, the real person within. And he's saying, due to this struggle, this attack of the enemy, what this one is going through and receiving no help from God, this one says, my heart was as wax. It melted in the midst of my very essence. Verse 16, 15 in English. My power dried up as pottery. And this would be pottery pieces that are old and very brittle and easily broken. So his power has been burst into pieces. And my tongue... It, it clings to my jaws, we would say in English, the, the roof of my mouth. What it's saying is, he is so weak, he's suffering so greatly that he has no power and not even the power to speak. Some who see this entire psalm as, as messianic or the majority speaks about how when one is, is on the cross, Due to the intensity of pain, he, he perspires in a very, very strong way, profusely. And because he perspires profusely, he becomes dehydrated. And, and, and there's, there, the, it makes it difficult for one to, to even speak. Other factors as well contributes to this. And this is what we see here. My, my tongue clings to my jaws and to the, the dust of death you have set me. So this one is speaking that death is, is very imminent, very close. It is at hand. Now, I want to conclude with the next verse because we have a very controversial verse. And this is the verse that, that the rabbinical commentators will translate it one way and Christian commentators translate it another. Let's just read this in, in how it appears in your Bible and then we'll talk about what the issues are and then we'll conclude. For dogs surround me now dogs by and large from a biblical standpoint dogs speak about animals that are not pleasant those that are dangerous those who go around in packs 
and and do what is necessary for survival, their survival. They're, they're hungry and therefore they, they pose a, a threat. Oh, do all dogs do that? No. All dogs in the Bible? No. But, but by and large, from an Old Testament perspective, this is how dogs are portrayed. For dogs, they surround me or have surrounded me. And notice how dogs are being used in a poetic way because dogs had a negative connotation in that culture for the most part. It talks about a dot meraim, a congregation of wicked ones. So these dogs are wicked ones. They're human beings, and they also not just surround, but now we have a synonym for, for encircling. So this one feels threatened. That's what it's saying here. Threatened by evil ones, ones that stand in opposition to the things of God. And then let's read in, in Hebrew the last, literally the last three words of this verse. And we're going to conclude with those three words. Word says, ka'ari yadai ve raglai. Now, part of this, two of the three words are very easy. When we see the word yadai and raglai, we know we're talking about my hands and my feet. The problem is, is this word. Is it ka-ari? Now, ari can be another word. We have the word arye back. Let me tell you the verse. Verse uh, 14 in Hebrew, 13 in English. We have that, that lion that tore its prey and roared. Well, we have a similar word, not the word arye, but ari. Ari is a common name in Israel and among Jewish people. Ari means lion. But what's important to know is this. The Septuagint, it has a different understanding than as a lion. Some would say, most rabbinical translations would translate this, <coughs> excuse me, as a lion, my hands and my feet. Now that really doesn't make sense. There is in the Septuagint a word which means to, to uh, uh, dig and to literally make a hole, to pierce through a mountain to uh, uh, what we would call, in one sense, you go to a rock quarry and you dig out and they make holes in the side of a mountain or in the ground. And it's a word of intensity. And this is a word, karu. Well, some Bibles have that even in the Hebrew. Some of the older manuscripts, the Masoretic text does not. So I would argue, based upon some traditions of the Hebrew manuscripts and also the Septuagint and the, the context, it's better translated. They pierce, not the word ka'ari, but the word karu. And all we're talking about for the last letter is whether it's a, a seven, it's called a yud, in Hebrew, that letter, but it's like a seven. It's very small. And if you make make the, the tail, the bottom part, a little bit longer, it becomes a different letter. Instead of a yud, a vav. In many places, we have manuscripts in different words, different places within the Bible, where there is a debate, is it a yud or is it a vav? And we have manuscripts that support both. And when I say manuscripts, I'm talking about manuscript traditions, not just one or two, but, but many. So in light of that, you could translate it as the Septuagint does and as it's understood in, in this context, which is my hands and my feet, taru, they pierce. They, they do something. And what's that? Well, we know when Messiah was on the cross that his hands were 
pierced with those nails. And also there was a longer masmer that was driven through both ankles. And one of the things we know is that they were a thick. So it wasn't a pierce like some, some pen that just, just pricked through and pierced it. But it was much thicker, and that may be why the word karu is very appropriate and did not use the word for simply piercing and simply making a hole or stabbing. That's used other places, but here we have a much stronger word. So when we look at some of the controversial verses and some of the explanations, we see that if we really do a good job of, of study and we rely upon the best manuscripts and the majority of the traditions of those manuscripts, we find that, that they speak clearly and authoritatively concerning the person, work, and identity of Messiah Yeshua. The Word of God is not confusing. It brings clarity to us and brings clarity in our life. Well, I'll close with that until next week, and we press on in the second part of Psalm 22. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.